Let me introduce myself. I'm Aaron Geller. I know a lot of you, um, and but not all of you. And I'm sure many of you all know each other, but I'm sure we don't each know everyone. So the first part of today is going to be just a little bit of introductions. And so that some of us, you know, so at least we can get to know each other in small groups. Obviously, this would be much easier if we were all together in person, which we hope to do soon, whenever, you know, we're able to actually gather in person. Um, you, as probably many of you know, we do have a, a grant that is supposed to fund an in-person physics REU group meeting that was going to be now, but of, you know, obviously we're not doing that now, but we will do that in the future. So that is, uh, that will happen when we are all able to safely meet again in person. But in the meantime, we're doing this virtually. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I am the past chair of the um, executive committee for our group. And we will be kind of rotating that whole thing in, in a month or so. And I will be, this actually may be my last like official thing as a member of the executive committee. So it's kind of a fun thing for me. Although I will still be involved with you all. And uh, of course I'll help organize the meeting that we'll, we'll still likely have at Northwestern when we can do it in person. Um, Coming in to our to the MPRLG Executive Committee will be Satya Guruswamy, who is here right now. Um, thank you all for electing and for voting. And you know, we had a, a very easy election in our group. So that's that was wonderful. Um, Satya, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you want to just kind of say hello so that maybe for those of you who are in speaker mode, you get to see Satya's face. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I, I just, um, I think this group is amazing and uh, I think I learned a lot from various members of this group uh, over the past year since joining and uh, I look forward to working with you all and serving your community. Wonderful and Sadia, we're really looking forward to working with you too and thank you so much for, um, you know, being willing to take on this role and I'm sure that we'll do great work all together. Um, let me also allow Brianna and Daniel to introduce themselves. Brianna, you want to go and then Daniel? Sure. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm Brianna Mount. Uh, I'm at Black Hill State in South Dakota near Stanford Lab, and um, I am the chair elect of the NPRLG. So I'm excited to, to hear the discussions today. Hi all, uh, my name is Daniel Serrano. I am a program coordinator of the University of Maryland Physics REU, and I am the current chair of the executive committee of the NPRLG. Fantastic. And, uh, and of course, on my screen, sitting next to Daniel, I just, I don't want to put you on the spot either, but I see Garfield Warren, who is great to see you. He was just the most recent past chair who, who stepped, you know, rotated off. So welcome, Garfield, good to see you. Okay, so let me um, dive in a little bit to the content of this session. We are going to have a little bit of introduction. I'm gonna basically share with you some of the motivations for why we have the NPRLG, why we have this physics group to begin with, uh, physics RU group and um, give a little outline of the session. So the session is going to start with me doing that. Then Daniel is going to give you all a little introduction to Slack. I see that a lot of you have joined Slack, which is great. This is a new initiative that Daniel started, which is fantastic. And um, then we'll go into breakout rooms to share some lightning intros um, and extra points to anyone who noticed the, the typo in our email for the lighting intros. They're actually lightning, <laughs> lightning intros. Lightning intros might be fun too. Um, and then we'll come back together for a full group discussion, kind of summar summarizing what we have all shared in the small groups. Uh, and that'll be it for really for the introductory session today. And of course, then we'll move on to doing another session that has uh, really great information on recruiting and supporting students. Okay, so for the motivation for why we have this, um, this group and why we all try to come together once in a while. 
some of this motivation, you know, comes from all of us. We want this, right? Of course. And, and it's really helpful to all of us to have these common um, goals and to be able to work together toward them and to have each other as resources to ask questions, you know, and, and support each other. And some of the motivation comes from the NSF. So back a few years ago, Kathy McLeod, the program manager, I guess at the time, program manager for the REU program in physics, um, basically told us that she wants information on how to sell the program to other, NS other members of the NSF and beyond the NSF. Uh, and, and so we've developed some initiatives along these lines. I'm just gonna kind of go through some of the things that we have discussed in the past, just to remind us of the motivation. So there are currently, you know, between 400 to 500 physics REU participants per year, depending on how you count. And undergraduates complain and data corroborate that it's harder to get accepted into a physics REU site than into a physics graduate program. And this, I'm sure we all can recognize. I mean, some of us get 500 or more applications per year for less than 10 spots. I mean, that is crazy when you really think about that. It's a, the RU programs is a priority within NSF physics, but with flat budgets, the NSF and other agencies have been seeing um, there at the time and currently really no funds to expand the program. And Kathy and other people at the NSF would love to expand the RU program in the future. And of course, in order to do that, we need to make a case for why that would be necessary. And so part of what we want to do is gather data to show this, that there's an unmet demand. Um, and some of this, of course, is in the number of applica applications that we get. And we've taken surveys of that in the past, and we'll continue to do that in the future. Um, so Kathy also noticed there's increasing external pressure to assess the NSF RU program as a whole. And um, basically, what Kathy told us is that we can decide how we want to assess ourselves as a group. Um, but if we don't, likely someone else will. And so this is part of the reason why we have this initiative to use SIMR, which we'll actually talk about later on in the meeting to have group assessments. And we actually have, uh, and that meaning assessment um, that all of us will can participate in with our students. The data can be aggregated and shared uh, anonymously with the NSF. Um, we have funding in our grant to support this, and we'll talk about this later. But this also includes figuring out how to track participants longitudinally and determining what long-term impact the, of the REU is on these students. Um, and I know that we all believe that this is positive, but we need like hard evidence to support that. Separately, Kathy also noted that one of the most common complaints she hears from the undergraduate students is that it, and this was previously they have often had to decide whether to accept one offer before learning whether they are accepted at other places to which they applied um, and this was a problem maybe five years ago and this was when i was starting to just get into the group and we have all since then moved toward a common application um, acceptance timeline where we where we can offer acceptances whenever we want, basically, but we don't require students to respond until a certain day. And that is something that we have all agreed to adopt, and we will adopt it again this year. This is not true for the international sites because they have a different timeline, but for the majority of the, the kind of sites that are in the US, we can and should abide by this because it's really important for the students. This has also been, uh, adopted and, and collaborated with the astronomy program. The astronomy program has actually been doing this for a very long time. We, I'm also on the astronomy side. Um, so the astronomy RU directors have been doing this for a long time. And we try to kind of coordinate so that the deadlines are roughly similar. Uh, okay, so all of this from the NSF has kind of culminated into us wanting to do a few common uh, things. And one is um, common assessment efforts, like I mentioned common application deadlines, which I, which I mentioned. Um, measuring the demand for REU opportunities. Okay, so like I said, we've done some of this, but I think we could do more. Collaborative recruitment efforts, which is something we'll discuss at this meeting. 
Um, alternative ways of evaluating um, candidates and RU applicants is something that we've talked about in the past, common applications, things like that. Um, and we are always planning for the future and how we're going to maintain our, our group. And we're, we're going to discuss that more toward the end of the, of the meeting here. So hopefully that kind of sets the stage a bit. And um, I already see that I'm running late. So let me hand this over to Daniel to talk a bit about Slack. That sounds good. And um, I don't think I'll be taking too long. So um, what I wanted to show you all is a couple of tools that we've uh, put together so that to, to sort of enhance the experience for this workshop, uh, you know, maybe some of you have already attended some of these online group events. And um, at least from my perspective, it's, it becomes a little bit hard to uh, get a sense of like who's there and like how to really network and communicate outside of the main events, right? So we what we did to try to miti mitigate some of this is um, to uh, put together a Slack uh, workspace. So um, we sent information about this through the through the um, kind of like email that had all the logistics that you should have received. But in case you didn't, or in case that you haven't uh, joined the Slack channel, um, I'm just going to show you a little bit about that and point you to, let me open the chat uh, here and point you to this uh, URL. And uh, it's go.umb.edu REU Slack, which will take you to the to this, to, to what I see here. Well, uh, um, it, you'll see a, a set of instructions that go before this, where you, if you don't have a Slack account, you will need to sign up and all of that. But once you go through those steps, I just wanted to show you a little bit about what the Slack uh, interface looks like and, and sort of a little bit about our, the purposes that we have for this. So uh, once you reach Slack itself, uh, it's likely that you will find yourself in the uh, hashtag 2020 uh, workshop. Uh, space. And so the way that Slack works is that you have a workspace and this one is called NPRLG. And then within that, you have different channels that you can use for different purposes. Um, and so you uh, will probably find yourself in the 2020 workshop as the default. And we created this channel just to have any sort of conversation uh, about the topics that we're discussing here. So for example, I go into this, uh, this workspace and then I can, or this, this channel, and I can just type in a message here, whatever I wanna say, hit enter, and then the message will appear in that channel. So for example, I have already posted a few things uh, like this uh, uh, announcement that said, hi, hi channel, nice to see everyone. And then a little bit of information about this map uh, thing that I'm gonna talk about in, in a second. And then I've been sort of announcing when each session is gonna happen and just a convenience uh, with the Zoom link there for uh, anyone to, to be able to join easily to the session. So this channel, you know, um, sorry to put you on the spot, Chris, Christopher, but uh, someone already posted something. And so, you know, this is a post there and just feel free to react to that, uh, engage in conversation and feel free to use this channel for that. So the other one that's important for this is this 2020 intros uh, channel which we created to just sort of like uh, have a space for everyone to say who they are. And so that we get a sense of who's around, who's at the, the event and be able to identify some other individuals that have any sort of similarities or differences with us that we might want to engage about, right? So um, if you go into the 2020 intros uh, channel itself, you will already see some introductions that have been made, but um, if you, hover over here to this little pin icon, you will then be able to access uh, a post that I made that is pinned, which means that you can just access it through, through this icon. Or you can also just scroll up all the way near the beginning of the, the conversation in this channel to see my pinned post. And it shows up like highlighted in a different color. But the reason for this pinned post is that it has this template uh, for you know a, a suggestion on, on what uh, items you could include in your introduction. So all you would really need to do is copy this, paste it into a message here, and then update the fields. But feel free to just um, you know, write, write your own version of how you want to introduce yourself in, in free form as well. 
We just want to get uh, give a space for everyone to be able to say, hey, I'm here. This is who I am. And then everyone else to just kind of like browse around these messages and see, you know, who who came by, where they come from, what university they're representing, and then, you know, what they might be interested in, in talking about. Um, I think that covers Slack. Um, if you have any questions about technical aspects, just feel free to reach out to me um, and I'm happy to uh, work with you to, to work out the, the usage uh, of this. Then the other thing we created is a map, a map of participants, because sometimes, uh, you know, like I was saying, it's just kind of hard to get a sense of who's around at, at a given event. And so we thought this might be a nice way for everyone to see who's around and particularly who's around that is also physically nearby to maybe try to develop some uh, collaborations uh, with those that are, are around us uh, geographically um, that maybe we didn't even know uh, that they were you know present or or, or their their institution was interested in RU programs or something like that so in order to access that map uh, and be able to add yourself um, I created a short link as well which is go.umd.edu slash site 2020 map and I've posted it into the chat. So feel free to just, you know, the, all of these things are optional. So, um, and, and just so you know, this map is publicly available uh, for anyone that has the link. So keep that in mind, but we encourage you to add yourself um, to the map so that we can kind of like get a sense of who's here um, and encourage some connections. Uh, that's all I had in terms of technical aspects and, and, um, and tools available. And I just reloaded. I got a request to to reload. I just did that. Uh, do you see yourself there, Alan? Okay, cool. All right, that's 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 it for me. That's fantastic. I love that map thing. I actually did that with my RU students this summer for a few different um, activities, just to kind of start the, just to break the ice. Um, so you know use that with your students if we especially if you're remote next year maybe um maybe that'll be a fun way to get everybody talking about about things um thank you daniel for putting together the slack channel also i encourage this so we do have as you as you know we have a email a google groups email that we all send you know can send emails to and and we can Daniel and and Brianna and I and, and Satya will be sending emails to you all from that email account. But this Slack channel is another way to communicate. And it just gives a little more flexibility. So you know, either way to communicate is fine. We just want to make communication routes open to everybody. Okay, so for the next uh, about a half hour, we're going to go into breakout rooms. And this is where we'll do our lightning intros. You'll be in breakout rooms with a few other people. And before we go in, let me just tell you what we want to do in there. We are going to, each site will get about five minutes to kind of introduce yourselves. You don't have to spend the entire five minutes. Um, but ideally, that's like a three minute presentation in the full accounting with two minutes of questions. But let's do it this way. Let's all give our presentations first. And then we'll save questions for afterwards just to make sure we have enough time for everyone to say a little bit about themselves. Um, if you, you know, read through the full email and you saw that there was a request for lightning intros, you may have already prepared something specific. You may even have slides. That's great. If you don't have slides, that's also fine. I personally do not have slides, so that's okay. Um, but the questions kind of that we wanted you to consider was what makes your program unique? What is your program's biggest strength and, and maybe the biggest problem you want help with? What might you be able to contribute to the larger community, if anything? Um, you know, like for instance, is there some aspect of your program that works really well that you can contribute in a remote setting um, that you can share on YouTube or something like that? And what do you want to get out of this meeting and the MPRLG in general? And so, um, in each room, like I said, we'll each go around to share. We'll need one person to, or a few people to be note takers. Daniel, if you can share in the chat the page that we have, thank you. Daniel just shared a link in the chat that will 
from there give you links to your a link to your note taking page if you want to do it this way. Um, so I would suggest that you take notes in the Google Doc that Daniel has created and you will know where to go once we assign you your breakout rooms. You'll know which which breakout room you're in. So someone or a couple people can take notes and then when we come back, we will have time for every room to give just a quick summary of some of the fun things that they've learned. All right. Um, any questions about this before we break out into different rooms? So that each of those documents that you will go into depending on your breakout room number has that list of items for discussion that Aaron just met, mentioned. Um, so so I, I don't have access. I have three or four. This is a heads up. We'd like to take a picture of everyone at the end of this session. So please stick around with that uh, for that. Um, for the remainder of the afternoon, I'm very excited to say we have a panel on supporting and recruiting underrepresented minorities at our sites. Uh, we have three experts that are here uh, to discuss this with us today. Uh, they will each be talking about recruitment strategies for different groups targeted um, by our programs, uh, but also very importantly, they will be talking about support strategies once students are at the RU sites. Um, so a big welcome and thank you to our three panelists. Uh, today we have with us um, Arlene Modesti Knowles. Uh, she's the Team Up Diversity Project Manager at the AIP. We have Ramon Lopez, who is the pre uh, professor at University of Texas at Arlington, and Alex Rudolph, who is a professor of physics and astronomy at Cal Poly Pomona, P bleh, Pomona and the founder and director of the CalBridge program. Uh, I think they're each gonna introduce themselves a bit more fully and share their expertise with us. Uh, each will have give or take 15, 20 minutes uh, or less if they'd like, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions after all three have presented. So I know that's always the hard part to save your questions, um, but, but we'll let all three um, go before we start asking questions. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, start with Arlene. Hi everyone, thank you. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Okay, here we go. All right, does everyone see my presentation? Thumbs up? Yeah, looks great. Okay, great, thank you. I'm not gonna spend any time at all introducing myself <laughs> um, because I wanna take a little bit of time to go over the team up report uh, in case people haven't heard about it or, or know what's in it. So I wanna do some of that and I apologize ahead of time if I go over because I tried to get this down as quickly as, as much as I could and it was tough. So let me try to try to do that. Anyway, I wanna thank uh, Brianna very much for in, inviting me to present to you all about the team up report and some recruiting and uh, supporting strategies for recruiting African-American students. Make sure I'm on the right place. So just to tell you a little bit about Team Up. Team Up is the task force to elevate the representation of African Americans in undergraduate physics and astronomy. Why was the Team Up task force um, commissioned? It was commissioned because in the previous 20 years or the two decades prior, physics has seen unprecedented growth in the bachelor bachelor's degree production uh, it's a little bit of a tongue twister. Uh, bachelor's degree production, but African-American production has not seen the same growth. It hasn't kept pace. And so the fraction of African-Americans earning degrees in bachelor's uh, physics, bachelor's degrees in physics um, has remained flat and at times has declined. So AIP commissioned a task force and I always show this task force picture because I want to stress the importance of walking the walk and uh, talking the talk. And obviously the task force is very diverse demographically, but we also have diverse perspectives uh, and diverse areas of expertise. So we have physicists and astronomers, as well as social scientists that were part of this project. On the right, you'll see the the upcoming president of APS, Jim Gates, he was on our task force. And on the, on the upper left, you'll see uh, Jedida Eisler, who was just 
named to the Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, NASA transition team. So the charge from the AIP board was to examine and assess the reasons for the persistent underrepresentation of African-Americans in physics and astronomy at the bachelor's level and to produce a report uh, with evidence-based recommendations. And so that is what we did. Oops, sorry. So here's the report. The time is now systemic changes to increase African-Americans with bachelor's degrees in physics and astronomy. And I do hope that you read it. If you haven't read it already, you can find it on our website. So to go right to the conclusions, the conclusions from the report is that the persistent underrepresentation of African Americans in physics and astronomy is due to the lack of a supportive environment for these students in many departments and to the enormous financial challenges facing both those students and the programs that have consistently demonstrated best practices in supporting their success typically HBCUs and black serving institutions. And then solving these problems really will require systemic and cultural changes involving a change management framework. So the goal of this report certainly was to inform the um, community, but also because we wanna double the number of African-Americans earning degrees, bachelor's degrees in physics and astronomy by the year 2030. And we think, with the um, community of individual faculty and departments, colleges and universities, professional societies, private and public funding agencies working together, we can do that. So I'm gonna go over the team up factors. Each factor had four findings. Um, so these factors, by the way, are, are factors that um, contributed or detracted from the success of African-Americans uh, in physics and astronomy. Each factor had four findings and five recommendations. Obviously, I don't have the time to go over those, but I'm gonna try to get through these quickly so I can get to the other things that I wanna talk to you about. Factor one was belonging. Fostering a sense of belonging was really uh, essential for African-American student persistence and success. And by the way, I've included some student um, quotes from our interviews, so you can uh, read those as I go along. Um, but the sense of belonging is about welcoming, being welcomed and valued in the department. And it was important for students to feel that in order to persist. Factor two was physics identity. And you know, to persist, African Americans, African American students really need to perceive themselves um, as future physicists and astronomers, but also to be perceived by others, most notably faculty, um, as future physicists and astronomers. Um, and the way to build physics identity really is for students to engage in the activities of physicists and astronomy and astronomers. So that includes research experiences like they would have in your programs. Um, it is important to note that physics culture most strongly associates, associates who can be a physicist with white males. And so students have to navigate and overcome uh, these stereotypes in order to see themselves as physicists. And that is an extra burden for those students. Factor three is academic support. And obvious, that's obvious. We're in academic institutions. Of course, students need academic support. But effective teaching and strengths-based approach to that support is what was really important for Afri African-American students. So. Um, it was important for them to know that their faculty and the, those who are educating them can see them as being capable of uh, doing the work, even if they don't have perhaps some tools, resources, and maybe some skills that can um, help them as they go along. So that's, that is the job of the faculty, right? Um, but faculty who are engaged and know their subject matter, um, that can communicate it well, and are passionate about teaching were most effective for these students. Personal support. So, um, you know, departments may not feel that they need to provide personal support to, to students. I mean, you're there to educate them, right? Um, but your students, particularly African-American students are facing particular personal stressor, stressors that are affecting their ability 
to be successful in the classroom. And that is your purview. And so to the extent that faculty and, and department stakeholders and leaders can um, help to mitigate those burdens, the students can be more successful. And I think we've seen that too with COVID-19. It's, it's uh, uncovered so many racial disparities in our society, in, in health and wealth and education and workforce, um, as well as the racial injustice that has been really uh, highlighted in the last few months. And these are things that are affecting students uh, and, and affects their ability to succeed and um, learn their material. And then leadership and, structure, and structures, right? For sustainability, academic and dis disciplinary leaders must prioritize creating environments, policies and structures that maximize African-American student uh, success. And that includes policies um, and practices and um, the ways in which you communicate around your department. Um, so those are all important um, for supporting students. And then of course, change management. Um, for there to be systemic cultural change, there has to be attention to change management and there's a whole body of research around this. So understanding this research and engaging it um, helps to, to make any changes more su sustainable. So um, those were sort of the main crux of the report. My summary of the report, African-American students need specific supportive environments to persist in physics and astronomy, but they aren't broken and they don't need fixing. Um, to capture and sustain their interest in these fields and to see them through to the degree, a culture of caring and commitment to their success must be cultivated in the department and communicated by those who are gatekeepers of the field. And that's you. So the next steps for uh, Team Up, I just wanna tell you quickly what we're doing next because Team Up was never meant to just be, this was never meant to just be a report. It was meant to be an actionable thing to create change in our fields. So what we're doing next, we're going to have some report implementation workshops, January 28th, 29th. We're looking for departmental teams. Uh, we wanna support a, a core set of departmental teams in developing and executing action plans in line with the team up report recommendations. And we will be focusing on African-American physics and student, uh, physics and astronomy student outcomes. And then we'll identify a, a broad set of best practices to be shared with the larger community and the departmental teams will learn about and become eligible for resources to help them in their implementation plans. The application deadline is December 4th and the application can be found on our website. Other initiatives that we're doing, one of the task force members um, who uh, worked with us on the team up report uh, applied for and received a, an NSF rapid grant and we're working with her to understand the impacts of COVID-19 university closures on uh, black physics undergraduate students. So uh, that study is in progress and we're working on that. Uh, we're also coordinating with APS IDEA on the change management piece and physics and astronomy sea change, which you will learn about at some point, I assume. All right, I'm going, I'm getting to the, uh, recruitment and support stuff. And I apologize for going over again. So when I was thinking about this, I am not in a department. So I really wanted to hear from students and faculty. And it just so happened that the National Society of Black Physicists Conference was just last week. And I found myself in a, um, a Zoom room with a number of black faculty and black students. And I posed the question to them. I'm going to be talking to the REU site directors what do you want me to tell them? So the first one was, it kind of took me by surprise, but I, I, it makes sense. Um, and the first one was self-reflection. So the question is, why do you, why are you involved in this RU process? And why are you interested in recruiting African-American students? Now, if it's about 
you know, whether you truly care about mentoring students and you really care about inclusion, then that's great. Um, if there are other um, motivations, so to speak, um, that doesn't say that those are wrong, but I would maybe hold off on recruiting African-American students until you can ensure that you can provide a robust experience for those students and a supportive environment for those students because anything less could be very damaging to the students. So self-reflection is an important piece to that. There's no judgment about it. It's just what who benefits from your REU program. Build mutually beneficial relationships with black faculty. You, you may have heard this. I'm gonna tell you the secret if you haven't heard it. Faculty at HBCUs and predominantly black institutions, they're not sending your, their students to you unless they've established a relationship built on trust and they know that their students are gonna have a good experience. So they've gotta know that you're committed not only to admitting diverse students, but also to supporting the success of their students. So how do you build those relationships? Well, you certainly could go to the NSBP um, meeting. I, I recommend all of you go to that meeting and, and become members and even exhibit, um, but also you could think about scientific collaborations with black faculty and faculty of color. Um, you could go and give a colloquium talk at some HBCUs or black institutions and have them come to your institution and give talks to. So build the relationship and I promise you that will bear fruit when it comes to recruiting uh, REU students. What are you advertising? So I, in preparation for this talk, I went on to the NSF um, REU site and looked at probably about 30 of your abstracts and only about five or six actually mention um, a focus on mentoring or a focus on considering students from underrepresented um, groups. Now the rest talked about their cutting edge research and students getting a chance to work with world renowned scientists and all of the wonderful equipment. Um, and I think that's great and that is exciting and that's what students need to do, but it's also very institution focused. It's intimidating and not exactly welcoming. And students are savvy consumers, right? They, they'll gravitate to places that seem to want them. So consider what you're advertising. So even if you can't change the abstract, at least in your flyers, make sure you're really communicating and conveying what it is that you really want to do with your REU. Campus location, here's the truth. If your institution is in a region that is not very diverse, you're not gonna get a, you're gonna have a harder time attracting African-American students. However, if you're doing all of the other things, building those relationships with black faculty, um, I promise you, you can get African-American students into your REU program. Campus climate, now is it welcoming? So your REU program might be great and maybe diverse and maybe very supportive, but if the campus climate is hostile, that's gonna be a problem. Students talk, we know things on the news. Um, so I would suggest maybe connecting with the DEI office and seeing if you can brainstorm ways in which you can sort of mitigate those issues and make sure to have uh, a positive experience for your REU students. And finally, less emphasis on the GPA, more on holistic um, evaluation. You know, the team up study revealed that students are dealing with a multitude of stressors. We're all dealing with COVID-19. Students are dealing with racial injustice. I know for me as a grown woman, um, seeing the killing of George Floyd and so many other black people who look like me was very um, detrimental to my mental health. It was not a, an easy thing for me to deal with. And so students are dealing with that stress as well. Um, but beyond those societal issues, students may be working 30 hours a week. They may be taking care of a family. Um, they may be doing a host of other things that are important in their lives. They have to deal with that. Um, and so the faculty that I spoke to recommended looking at the students holistically, talking to the students directly, 
um, understanding what their particular circumstances are, what their professional goals are, the skills that they're interested in building. Um, and again, this is a place where if you've built those relationships with black faculty, they can help you to understand where the students are in terms of their, um, their capabilities, their research um, skills. So um, that's an important thing to know. In terms of retaining African-American students and supporting them, ensure students are working on quality projects. Um, the students are looking for robust projects. They are not looking for busy work and they're not looking to be cheap labor. They want to work on robust projects, but they also wanna be supported in being successful in those projects. So that's an important piece. Foster positive interactions among students. Now we found in the team up report that peer interactions were extremely important. Um, they can provide valuable support, but they also can diminish students self efficacy and persistence if those interactions are negative. So to the extent that site visit leaders, I'm sorry, site directors and um, faculty mentors can foster positive interactions among students, that would make for a more supportive environment for African-American students. And I would think all students, except a cohort of African-American students. Students don't wanna be the only all the time. So if at all possible, you can accept more than one African-American student and, or at least other students of color, that would, be, that would go a long way to um, mitigate the sense of isolation that students all, often feel, it's isolation and disconnection. Um, and it also, you know, it fosters more of a sense of belonging and then students can lean on each other for support. Connect to campus resources and identity-based groups. Connect the students to campus resources and identity-based groups. Um, the team up rep report discusses the importance of counter spaces, which are physical or virtual or social spaces where students in marginalized groups can themselves feel centered. Their experiences can be centered. And those are important actually for the persistence of the student in their program. So it's important for sites to connect the students. They're not on their campus now, so they're on your campus um, to connect them to those groups. Um, and I'm sure it would be helpful to all the students in your program to make sure that they're connected to other campus groups. Um, train faculty mentors in culturally responsive mentoring, please, please. We know that you all have world renowned faculty in your departments and in your programs. And I think that is wonderful. It is great, but they're also interacting with students and that has the potential to either be affirming or damaging. So to the extent that faculty mentors can learn to more effectively mentor African-American students and other students of color, um, there'll be benefits for both. You know, the, the students of course will benefit because they'll feel more supported in their learning, but the faculty will also benefit because likely they'll get more productivity out of their students and the students will feel more able to bring their full selves to the, to the project. Address broader societal issues that may affect students. I can't stress that enough. I know that this probably doesn't feel like your job, but when, if for example, something happens over the summer that is like a George Floyd situation, or we're all dealing with COVID still, these are things that are affecting those students. And if they can't interact with you and their peers, around those things, then there's again, a sense of isolation and they can't bring their full selves to the plan. And then if in fact your RU is sort of a feeder to your graduate program, then invite the director of graduate studies to the program to get to know the students and maybe share with them um, more about the graduate program and how, um, what the process is for graduate school application. And I only say this because I've heard from students who has said, you know, I've gone to an REU and it was really diverse. And then I looked at the graduate program and there was not a single person of color in that graduate program. So there's some sort of disconnect. I don't know what that is. 
Um, but maybe if you can make a bridge by having the director of graduate studies involved in the program, um, that bridge can be overcome. Okay, that's all I have. Oh, and one last thing. Um, I had already done all of this and then I found a student account of what an REU is like and I'm gonna put that in the chat for you all to read later. Thank you. Well, thank you, Arlene. I think that was that was really useful. And I've been um, furiously taking notes and I realized um, I should ask you for your slides. I'm gonna ho hopefully I can press you to, to let me share them with everyone. Um, I think people probably have a lot of questions and I'm seeing stuff in the chat, um, but let's get through all our panelists first um, and then and then we can we can um, ask our panel some some more questions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So next up, we've got Ramon Lopez um, and I'll let him introduce himself a little bit more and I'm excited to hear from him, too. Okay, so let me share my screen. You see it? Now let's then go to the presentation mode. Yep, we can see it. Here's the little there. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ramon Lopez. I'm a professor of physics at the University of Texas at Arlington. And I'm also the current president of the National Society of Hispanic Physicists. Um, so I'm going to talk about some issues relating to Hispanics and physics in general, but uh, that have particular import for REUs. Now, one thing you have to consider is preparation of students. Um, you know, there's a very broad range of level of preparation in K-12. And so uh, many Hispanic students are, might have not had the opportunity to pursue the same level of science and math courses that some of the other students would have had. And um, then when they go to university, they are you know, underprepared relative to, to other students. Um, I actually can relate directly to that experience because, um, all right, I'm Puerto Rican, but I was born and raised in this country, but all the families in Puerto Rico. And uh, I went to high school in a small farming town of 500 people, 15 miles from the Wisconsin border in Western Illinois. And the high school had one hallway. <laughs> now that's not a function of me being a Hispanic student, but you might find a lot, of, a lot of students who are coming from those kinds of high school environments that don't have the same level of preparation. So that when I went to University of Illinois as an undergraduate, I was competing against students who had gone to places like Nutrier High School in Winnetka, Illinois. So um, I was not really well prepared at the beginning and I had some catching up to do. And you'll find that with a lot of Hispanic students because of the way that, that uh, they come to higher ed, many of them will begin their post-secondary education at two-year schools that are close to home. So they're not gonna have the same level of preparation coming into university. And that will affect their uh, initial grades. You know, People can catch up, but it might take a little bit of time. I caught up, I became a professor. But you, as you're recruiting for your REUs, you're gonna be looking at students who are maybe sophomores. And um, you can't use just a simple analysis of grades to really see what's going on with the student. You have to take a broader view in your evaluation of students because if you just use a simple grade cutoff, you're gonna miss potentially really good students. And even if you're looking at students who are juniors going into their senior year, um, take a look at things like the slope, not just the GPA, but the slope of the grades and um, 
if you have colleagues at a particular institution, uh, have them give you names of, or give you information about these students so you've got, got uh, more to go on and maybe more than what you would just get out of a letter of recommendation, have a conversation. And that actually points to something that Arlene said that I will come back to as well about establishing relationships with faculty because that's, that's really important. So if you're going to have a broader recruitment, you've got to be more flexible in that, that evaluation. And if uh, some of you are familiar with the APS Bridge Program, which has had great success in bringing students into graduate school, take a look at some of the recommendations there and think about how does that apply in your REU program. So of course there are financial issues because Hispanic students are disproportionately from lower SES backgrounds. And that's why a lot of them start off in the two-year uh, schools because tuition's a lot cheaper. And they'll often need to work while in school, which takes away time from study, which also has an impact on grades. And um, the financial support from the REU is an important factor, but you have to realize it may not make up for, for the summer work that they're doing. So you've got some limitations there and you might have an uphill uh, struggle in convincing a really good student that, yeah, you know, you might lose a couple of thousand dollars overall coming to this REU this summer because what we're going to pay you might not be what, what you could get elsewhere or it's going to break up what you'd plan to do as far as a job for the summer, but uh, that there would be other benefits that would, that would flow from participating in the REU. But understand that, that that's a real issue. And it's going to be an issue with many students. It's just going to be more so with Hispanic or African American students. Now, then there are cultural issues, um, such as the strong familial uh, connections. I mean, if you've got, if you're trying to recruit students, Cuban students from Miami, to come to Kansas for an REU, it's going to be a bit of a stretch especially if they've never been more than 100 miles away from family. And um, the same thing with, with uh, Hispanic students from California. I mean, uh, there's a great unwillingness to, to leave. I mean, I, all right, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican. I speak Spanish. I have lots of family and friends in Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, I go there a lot and I've been recruiting students from there to come to graduate school for years. And with all of that, I've only managed to get like a couple of graduates, a couple of students to leave the island to come to graduate school. Uh, REU might be easier because it's, you know, just a, a few months in the summer, but it's still really tough uh, because of those, those kinds of connections. And that's why building a personal bridge to students is very important. You may need to uh, build a relationship with the student, um, you know, starting when they're a sophomore, so that by the time they're a junior, maybe they're really interested in coming to your REU program. So it takes time. And it's not only with, with the students, it's also with where they're coming from. Um, because you have to go to where the students are. Now, it's true that Majority of minority students are at majority institutions, but there are um, MSIs and uh, the HBCUs where you find real concentrations of, of these kinds of students. And you have to build collaborative links with the faculty there. Arlene also made the same point. I mean, you can't helicopter in to an MSI and expect to be able to recruit students. You have to build links with the faculty, um, get to know people over time, establish patterns for recruitment, pathways. Think about what are some, some schools that have got a significant number of, of um, minority undergraduates. And maybe what we'll do this year is we'll start by contacting some faculty there and see if they'd be interested in having some of our faculty come and give a seminar go and visit the institution, give a colloquium, meet the students, and over time, you know, become known to students, to faculty on that campus. And then you're gonna have a much more productive recruiting visit where you can go there and say, hi, it's me again. And we have this REU program. 
because that that personal connection is really critical personal connection to the students personal connection to the faculty and particularly once they come to your reu you have to always be checking in being attentive to what they say what they do again certainly with hispanic students this might be the first time that they're significantly far away from home and uh, many of them might actually be living with their parents while they're going to college in part to save money and in part just because you know you live with your family and um, being away from that uh, can produce some unintended emotional consequences the homesickness right so while the students are there at your reu you really have to be attentive and really be listening to what they say and, and looking to uh, uh, be proactive in addressing any issues that they might have. And in that regard, always have them talk to your current and previous students to build that comfort level. Again, if you're going to be recruiting students who are already um, a little bit concerned about the financial implications, concerned about the, uh, the being so far away from home, being in a place where they don't necessarily uh, connect to the local culture. I mean, we recruited some, some students from, from uh, LA who are uh, Mexican American students and they came to UT Arlington. Now we've got lots of Mexican restaurants and things like that, but it's really funny that these guys talking about their tacos are not like our tacos. <laughs> So there's there's stuff like that. Actually, one of the things I did to uh, to raise their comfort level is when they were here, um, I took them to uh, a Whataburger so they could try out the Texas Whataburger. And then I also drove them past the In-N-Out Burger so that they would know that In-N-Out Burger is here in Texas as well, because that, that could have been a deal breaker if there was no In-N-Out Burger for one of these students. So little things like that. And the best way to address those is to have them talk to other students. Now, what that means is that your current students have to be happy with the situation. If you do not already have a welcoming, inclusive environment, and your students, your current students aren't gonna you know, communicate that to incoming students, you're not gonna get these students to come to you and maybe you shouldn't. So you have to make sure that your own environment is in good shape, that your own students can be your best ambassadors because they're very happy with the way things have gone. And that will produce a lot more success for you when you recruit students and also helping to support students because students will talk to students first before they come and talk to faculty. Um, Arlene also talked about, um, well, I, I wrote it as design meaningful projects. And that's also very important. You don't want busy work. You want students to really get into something that's important in physics um, so that they feel that they've accomplished something because nothing succeeds like success. If you have students who come and accomplish something, then they go back feeling, hey, I can do this. Now, a meaningful project is going to be different for different students. You have to be attentive to student abilities and scaffold accordingly. Uh, I'm primarily a space plasma physicist, but I also work in physics education research. And in cognitive psychology, there's a famous guy by the name of Lev Vygotsky who coined a phrase, the zone of proximal development. So if you consider knowledge as some kind of phase space and you've got a boundary, which is your, your current knowledge. There, there are things beyond that current knowledge in that phase space that are accessible given your current understanding and things that are not accessible. So you want to really uh, design projects that fit an individual student's background and ability so that the project is challenging, but also achievable. Because when that student has success, then that's gonna breed a sense of confidence. If the student does not have success, then you can have exactly the opposite effect and, and damage the student's uh, identification um, as a physicist. So I think that's all that I've got here. And yeah, I'll, I'll share my slides with you guys. I'll send, send it to you in an email. Um, 
I'm not sure exactly how long we're going to go, but it turns out that today and tomorrow we have the Texas section of the APS going on. And I've got seven students giving presentations. So um, at, I, I said, I, I messaged Arlene earlier saying, I'm out of here at two o'clock, but I'll stay till 2.30 your time because I checked and, and my students aren't on, on until after that. But at 2.30 uh, your time, I'm gonna have to go. Okay, well, thank you for taking time out to, to be with us today. And we've got, um, I think, I'm getting my time zones confused, about 48 minutes scheduled. Um, but, but yes, thank you, Ramon. Um, and I'll make sure to share those slides with everybody. Um, so last but not least, um, we've got Alex Rudolph. Um, so I'll just let you take it away, Alex. Oh, I think you're muted. Yep, helps if I am mute. Okay, th thank you all very much for uh, for being here and taking the time. And um, I don't have any slides, but I will just speak to you uh, briefly. I hope about a few things. Um, I would just say Ramon and Arlene really covered a lot of ground that I would reiterate, and I'll sort of reinforce those at the end. I mean, if you just heard those two presentations, you'd kind of have a big fraction of what you need to know. And so, really following their advice is my first thing to tell you. Um, I just, I was asked to talk about recruiting community college students, so I'm just going to say a little bit about that. Um, I do want to say that what I'm going to say is some of it may feel specific to California because the program I've created is in California, but I think there are things that will translate to anywhere. Uh, so just you'll have to th think and pick and choose and maybe in the questions we can explore that. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes um, without slides, but just briefly describing the programs that I run because that kind of gives context to what I'm saying and why uh, I'm being brought in at all as somebody who may know something about this. So there's two main programs and the one that I wanna start with is not a summer program, it's called CalBridge, it's a PhD bridge program. And it's just sort of in context of what we're doing in California, it's, it's a program designed to help undergraduates in California from groups traditionally excluded from STEM fields to go on for their PhD. And particularly we're starting the physics and astronomy, and we're now expanding into computer science. Um, so I just want to give you guys a little context about California. You may or may not know this, but there's three three levels to the California public education system. There's the University of California, which everybody's familiar with. Those are research universities. And sort of the top 10% of high school students are expected to go to those. They're sort of the top tier, if you will, of the, of the university system. The second tier, which I'm part of, is called the California State University which does not grant PhDs, only bachelor's and master's. And sort of the remaining top third of students would go to a CSU is, is the intention. And I will just say that the CSU is the largest, most diverse public university in the country. We have almost a half a million undergraduates at 23 campuses, and it's about 50% underrepresented minority students. So, and then there's the community, California community colleges of which there are 105. And they're obviously critical because a large fraction of students go to those as they do everywhere in the US. And so we do wanna pay attention to those groups. And they are in fact, at least in California, very, very diverse as well. They're almost all Hispanic serving institutions, many are minority serving institutions as well. So at least in places like California and Texas and Florida and New York and other places, community colleges are not just a source of students who are from typically lower socioeconomic backgrounds, but also just underrepresented in general. Um, so the program is designed to start with juniors and they're mentored for two years as undergraduates. If they go to a University of California uh, as a PhD, they get an additional year of support. It's a partnership between the CSU and the UC. And just really briefly, about 90% of those who graduate are in graduate school um, and about two thirds are in a PhD program, the other third are in a master's. So that's basically, I just wanna give that quick background about CalBridge um, because that's the context in which the uh, community colleges get, uh, get become part of this. Now the actual connections with community colleges that we built for CalBridge came out of a summer program, CalBridge Summer, which many of you know as Camp Hare, that's what was the original name. And that's the summer research program, not unlike REUs, except for one big difference, uh, which is that we are not providing research experiences for students at a site. We are collaborating with research sites that are uh, recruiting students and we become a recruiting mechanism for them. So we're coming up on our 12th summer and we basically recruit from all California State University and community college students to participate. So we are recruiting across the state over 60 institutions at once. 
and we take their applications and in, in, in applying to, to our program, they get considered by, as I say, about currently 20 different research sites. And that's changing and growing anytime uh, a new site wants to join us. But those sites get access to this very diverse pool of California students who are looking for a summer research experience. And the students get opportunity to apply to many, many, many sites one, at once without having to do all the different applications. Um, we've had over 220 participants over 11 summers. We're taking about 40 a year right now, uh, 40 to 50 a year and placing them around the country. Um, now the key point for this, what I'm saying is that you know, how do we recruit them? And that's kind of the point. So the main thing is that we have developed a relationship and that's the key word relationship with every one of these campuses, meaning we have at least one or more faculty or staff member who is locally there as what we call our liaison who does our recruiting for us. Now we of course support that and do things like visits and, and give them flyers and information and so forth, but they are tasked, they're, they're, they're joining in to be tasked to be part of the, the sort of recruiting effort. Um, and we have over 40 community colleges in that network. The way that network was built, that success was a result of a lot of hard work, including phone calls, Zoom calls, and visits. And I think that kind of leads to the first main points. Well, let me let me finish my factual statements, then I'll come back to this. But basically, that's kind of critical. That that time and effort is re is required. Um, about 15% of our participants come from community colleges, and many of our CSU participants transferred from a community college before they came to us. And that's also kind of key because you may have students in your programs now who are from a four-year university, but they themselves came from a community college and they can become a help in sort of building a relationship. Um, some of our community college participants have subsequently transferred to a CU to join the bridge program and are now going on for PhD. So we've had some success leading from summer research to the bridge program to a PhD program. And if anyone's interested in knowing more about Cam, I, I didn't give you a full picture, but if anyone wants to know more about the CalBridge and Camp Air Network and is interested in participating, just please reach out to me. So to get to the takeaways, um, I'm just gonna reinforce a lot of what Arlene and Ramon said. Uh, basically relationships with faculty and even students at community colleges and HSIs and MSIs and HBCUs are key. Um, and these have to be genuine partnerships. I think uh, Arlene, maybe they both mentioned, you can't, kind of show up as a, um, you know, we're coming here to give you something wonderful, an opportunity to apply to our REU. They're giving you as much or more than you're giving them, which is that you, you have to have that trust, that you have to build that trust, that they will feel that their students will succeed with you. And I think both Arlene and Ramon touched on that as being really critical. I would just heavily reinforce that we've worked really hard to build that trust. And we've worked really hard to make sure that the research sites we work with understand that and will have them succeed so that then they come back and tell their colleagues and their faculty, yes, this was a great experience, even if they went all the way to Rochester, New York, which by the way, I, I agree, it's very hard to get California students to leave, but we have places that they've gone. Wyoming is one of them, Rochester is one of them, pretty far flung places that people have gone and had a great time. Now, Rochester in the summer is a pretty nice place. You know, winter is another thing, but um, you know, Laramie, Wisconsin, Wyoming, we have had three students go on for PhDs at their physics and astronomy department uh, based on having done a summer there and more, and, and they, they just have such a great time and they get such a welcome, welcoming environment that they really buy into the idea that they could go see themselves there for a few years to do a PhD, for example. Um, finding the right partner at the campus you're trying to reach out to is critical. And that's, there's no, there's no magic way to do that. You could start with the department chair if you wanted, but if you can identify a physics faculty member, uh, and one way to do that is, for example, when students apply from community colleges and if you accept them, uh, then you look at their letter writers you know, and say, who are they? And if they sound like they're sort of you know, really encouraging types, just contact them, reach out to them and say, hey, we took such and such a student from your school. We'd like to create a more of a pathway for the for more of your students. How, you know, how could we work together? Like, you know, get, like you talked about, go give a talk, go visit and all of those things. Um, we did that. In fact, I think the way we started getting community college students is we looked, I saw that there was a community college, a, a Cal State student who had come from a community college, had a letter from a community college student, a faculty, uh, sorry, staff member. And I reached out to them and basically they became our liaison and our recruiter and they've sent us many more students. Now that person was a MESA director. And so the other thing I'll say is physics faculty is one way to go. MESA 
if you don't know, is um, Mathematics Engineering Science Achievement. It's a, it's a nationwide organization that supports underrepresented students uh, pursuing bachelor's degrees in STEM. And MESA directors are very plugged in typically in terms of you know, student contact. They have a large number of the underrepresented students in their sort of purview, and they can be a great source besides, uh, in addition to physics faculty. And I know many community colleges, almost all in California have a MESA organization. So you can find out by just looking on their website usually. So to finish, to wrap up, the most important message I can send is reach out to these universities, whether it's community colleges or MSIs or HSIs or HBCUs in the spirit of real partnership, understanding that you are asking their, you're trying to build trust, their trust in you uh, and you're trying to basically show them that you are, you know, let them lead in a lot of ways in terms of how to make the partnership work. That's really the critical message, in my opinion. Um, treat them as equals and ask them what would they, what, what, what do they need for the partnership to succeed? And they'll tell you about the trust and about the other factors that they need, many of which Arlene and Ramon touched on. Um, it takes time and effort, right? I spent a lot of time on the phone, on Zoom, visiting, but the good news is that when you get a net, you know, like we've seen with things like Facebook, much to our maybe dismay, but you know, building a network is kind of a nonlinear thing. Once you start doing it and get a few people on board, they talk to each other and they hear about it and then it becomes easier. They, people start to reach out to you. We've had now students hear about the program and apply from schools we've never had from before. And then we reach out to the faculty there and boom, we have another school to recruit from. So it does get easier as you, if you invest the initial time, and then I think one last thing I'll say is for all of you, I mean, you're welcome to you know, collaborate with a group like Campare or some other program that's helping with this kind of thing. Um, I would recommend starting locally with community colleges where you could go visit nearby and just uh, work, work with the people who you can really, you know, who, who also send students to your, under, to your university. You know, those are, the, those are the best places to start. Um, I'll stop there. So we have a few minutes before Ramon has to leave to ask uh, questions, but thank you for your time. All right, Alex, thank you very much. Um, so now uh, we get, uh, I think I think really the common theme it seems like partnerships and relationships. I think all three of you had really said that and I think that's it's a big takeaway. Um, but right now we'll open it up for questions. Um, I will try my best to catch the hand. So if you have a question, uh, please just raise the virtual hand in the uh, participant, par participant um, uh, pain over there or put questions in the chat and um, I'll try my best to keep up.